My name is Lester Anderson, and it's been a year since my world shattered into a million irreparable pieces. To say it simply blew up isn't entirely accurate. I played a significant role in its destruction. I orchestrated its downfall and then walked away amidst the chaos, with the assistance of about 60 accomplices who shared in the deceit. My wife, sadly, was among those collaborators, and there was a twisted satisfaction in seeing them all brought down alongside her. Before this seismic shift in my life, I was blissfully unaware, a content husband deeply in love with his wife, relishing in the joy of our shared existence. Our five-year marriage seemed like a dream, a cozy home, cherished friends and neighbors, fulfilling careers and supportive families. Financially secure, we were building a future together, but that future took an unexpected turn. I wish I could offer some rationale, a thread of logic to unravel the enigma of our relationship, but the truth eludes even me. She was my college sweetheart, kind, funny, and affectionate. She never displayed any inclination toward infidelity, never flirted with other men, nor dressed provocatively. I never once questioned her faithfulness. I'm employed in a research and engineering lab specializing in cutting-edge electronics for prestigious clients like NASA and the military. We affectionately refer to it as Geek Central. The interesting thing about us geeks is that while we thrive in the complexity of our professional lives, we keep things refreshingly simple at home. What you see is what you get. There's no elaborate facade because, frankly, we're not skilled in the art of deception. Some might view our demeanor as somewhat adolescent, and perhaps by conventional standards, it could be seen that way. We find joy in corny jokes, revel in quoting obscure movies and literature, and have a penchant for diving into intricate details. Despite any veneer of sophistication we may possess, we don't rank highly in the realm of social finesse. However, one thing we hold sacred is our commitment to honesty. In our world, honesty is not just a virtue, it's the cornerstone of our reputations and, consequently, our careers. Geeks don't lie. We understand that our credibility is paramount, both personally and professionally. My wife, Sandra, is employed in high finance at a firm called Wilson & Wilson, a major player in financing large-scale construction projects across the mid-Atlantic states. Despite their significant influence in the industry, I've noticed that many of Sandra's colleagues lack the academic pedigree I would expect. While they possess a solid grasp of financial matters, and some excel at spreadsheet programming, I often find myself feeling out of place when conversing with them, reminiscent of my high school days. A particular incident involving our decision to name our two kittens Oscar and Nat highlighted this divide. One of Sandra's co-workers suggested we should opt for names of more renowned figures, exemplifying the disparity in our perspectives. In their world, it seems status and conformity reign supreme, leaving me feeling like an outsider. Sandra and her colleagues are adept at navigating the intricate webs of finance, where every detail is meticulously documented, and personal ambition often takes precedence over individual integrity. The discomfort I initially felt among Sandra's co-workers escalated during the office Christmas party held at the nearby Marriott Hotel. Amidst the free-flowing alcohol and mingling crowds, distinguishing between employees and spouses became increasingly challenging. Overhearing a woman casually mention her work husband struck me as a stark reminder of the collective mindset prevalent in Sandra's professional circle, where alliances are formed for personal gain and loyalty is often fleeting. While I may not have harbored animosity toward them initially, Events like these gradually eroded any semblance of goodwill I once held. It was an unsettling remark that caught me off guard. My initial instinct was to whirl around and identify the speaker, but a sudden urge to remain inconspicuous seized me. Stop, listen, don't react. Blend into the background, a voice in my head urged. We'll all have the next week off, but I suppose we'll manage without crossing the street, one of the women quipped, prompting laughter from both. You could always conjure up a minor account emergency, another chimed in, eliciting even heartier laughter. What did they mean by crossing the street? Were they insinuating they'd need to return to work during the Christmas party festivities? The cryptic conversation troubled me, stirring a sense of unease. Despite my discomfort, I reassured myself, I made the right choice in marrying Sandra. Whatever they're implying, it can't be good. With that, 
I pushed the unsettling thoughts aside and rejoined the revelry. For the next three weeks, the incident slipped from my mind. However, on a Friday evening, as I ascended the carpeted stairs from our basement, I overheard Sandra's voice from upstairs. All right, I'll take care of it. What's a wife for, after all? She chuckled. Wife? What's that supposed to mean? I wondered aloud, turning the corner just in time to see Sandra hanging up the phone. What was that all about? I inquired, striving to keep my tone free of accusation. She visibly startled as I approached. Oh, that was Martin Harris. It's work-related. I need to head into the office tomorrow, and we'll have some late nights next week. There's an opportunity to assemble a funding package for a new apartment complex they're planning on J Street, Sandra explained. The memory of the cryptic conversation from the Christmas party resurfaced in my mind. Sounds like a minor account emergency, I remarked. Sandra chuckled. I wouldn't exactly call it an emergency, but it's an opportunity we can't afford to miss. I couldn't help but express my disappointment. We've both been putting in long hours this year. I was hoping we could take it easy this month and spend more time together. Sweetie, please don't be upset. These opportunities don't come around often. You have to seize them while you can, or they slip away, Santa reassured me. I promise I'll make it up to you. Her mention of wife caught me off guard. What's with the wife talk? I thought you were my only wife. How many husbands do you have? I quipped, trying to inject a bit of humor into the conversation. A flicker of surprise flashed across Sandra's face as she realized I had overheard her. Attempting to mask it with a smile, she reassured me, just you silly. It's something we say at the office. We joke about seeing more of our work partners than our actual partners at home. It's just a little office humor, everyone says it. Despite her attempt at reassurance, her trembling hands betrayed her underlying unease. I'll just go in for a few hours tomorrow to kickstart things and then we'll have the rest of the weekend together," she promised, her smile strained. The remainder of Friday night passed quietly, and Sandra left for the office on Saturday morning as if it were any other workday, albeit dressed casually. However, our promised weekend together didn't commence until after 7 p.m. Saturday night. Now, don't misunderstand me. I appreciate hard work and the importance of meeting deadlines. However, what troubled me was the sense of secrecy permeating our marriage. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was far more secrecy in our relationship than I had ever suspected. As I waited for Sandra to return home on that Saturday, my thoughts revolved around this newfound realization. Despite regularly sharing stories from my work and recounting anecdotes I'd heard, I suddenly became acutely aware that Sandra never divulged anything about her own job. It dawned on me that she had erected a substantial barrier between her work life and our home life a divide I had never truly comprehended before. When my wife finally arrived home on Saturday night, she headed straight for the shower while I got started on grilling some steaks. Despite my attempts to focus on cooking, my mind remained fixated on that unsettling wife or Mark. Even if it was meant innocently, it rubbed me the wrong way, leaving me feeling irked. Two phrases from the Christmas party continued to replay in my mind like a broken record. One was work husband, and the other was crossing the street. I couldn't shake the nagging question of whether these phrases held literal or figurative meaning. Considering Sandra's office location, I couldn't help but ponder the possibilities. Across the street were two prominent buildings, the first, a sizable medical practice, and the other, the Marriott Hotel. It dawned on me that many individuals at the Christmas party seemed intimately familiar with the layout of the hotel, sparking a flurry of unsettling thoughts. While I tried to rationalize their frequent visits as business-related lunches or client accommodations, my sour mood led my imagination down darker paths. That week, feeling an overwhelming need for a break from the lab, I made a conscious decision to have my lunch in the solitude of my car. As fate would have it, my parking spot happened to be conveniently located just a block away from my wife's workplace, affording me a clear view of the street stretching between her office and the Marriott. What unfolded before me left a bitter taste in my mouth. Around 11.45 on Monday morning, just before the lunch hour, I observed several couples strolling across the street and disappearing into the Marriott. 
By 12.30, the same couples leisurely made their way back to their respective offices. Not a single group of three or four, just pairs. While I didn't catch sight of my wife among them, my unease only intensified. The following day yielded a similar sight, different couples, but the same suspicious behavior. I entertained the idea of investigating further by observing the hotel lobby, but the risk of being recognized, particularly by Sandra, deterred me. In a move born out of desperation, I took a step I never imagined I would. That very afternoon, I enlisted the services of a private detective named Tristan Howard. I briefed him on what I had witnessed and outlined my desperate need for answers, providing him with a photograph of Sandra. His advice was as perplexing as it was disconcerting. Don't dwell on it. Resume your normal routine and trust that if there's something to be found, it will reveal itself soon enough. Though I voiced my hope that my suspicions were unfounded, I returned to work, grappling with a torrent of emotions. My investment in Tristan's services proved worthwhile. Thursday morning, he sat me down in his office and delivered the grim truth. On Wednesday morning, at precisely 11.45, my worst fears were confirmed. My wife entered the Marriott lobby with Martin Harris's arm draped around her waist. A fleeting stop at the reception desk secured them a key before they ascended to the fourth floor, not re-emerging until close to 12.40. Tristan, with his knack for gathering discreet information, had a private conversation with the desk clerk, shedding light on a disheartening truth. My wife and her alleged work husband were frequent guests at the hotel. This revelation came at a swift cost of $300, a mere down payment according to Tristan, who cautioned me that obtaining incontrovertible evidence would come at a higher price. Despite my internal turmoil and self-loathing for entertaining such suspicions, I resolved to pursue ironclad proof, even if it meant delving into the darkest corners of my thoughts. To achieve this, Tristan proposed a plan involving cooperation from the desk clerk and strategic room rentals. He would ascertain the room my wife and her colleague would occupy during their next visit, renting the adjacent rooms to install discreet video surveillance. It entailed additional expenses, a bribe included, but I was willing to pay whatever it took to uncover the truth. The past seven days had been excruciatingly painful. I attempted to distance myself from Sandra as much as possible, yet she couldn't help but notice my erratic behavior. Brushing off her inquiries with vague mentions of work, I doubted she bought my flimsy excuses. Despite my efforts to maintain a facade of normalcy, my heartache was palpable. When Sandra expressed a desire for intimacy, I reluctantly obliged, convincing myself that if I hadn't discovered anything concrete yet, perhaps there was nothing to find. But as we made love, my heart was heavy with a mixture of anger and anguish. It felt like my marriage was unraveling before my eyes, and yet, I lacked concrete evidence or a plausible explanation for my suspicions. Tristan's call from the clerk came as a bleak confirmation of my worst fears. He secured the room for the following Wednesday morning and evening, and I found myself sitting in his office on Thursday morning, clutching the evidence that shattered my world. Watching the gut-wrenching 40-minute video of my beloved wife, the very center of my universe, engaged in intimate acts with her supposed work husband Martin Harris, left me utterly devastated. In moments of turmoil, a geek's mind can wander down strange paths. I recalled an old joke about a husband discovering his wife's infidelity and threatening her lover with a gun, saying, don't laugh. You're next, but I vowed to maintain a sense of order amidst the chaos. They would face the consequences of their betrayal, and I would find the strength to walk away. Before confronting the situation head-on, I knew I needed some time away. Being under the same roof as Sandra felt suffocating, unbearable. So I arranged to take the rest of the week off, citing a need to be down at Wallops for the weekend if anyone asked. With that sorted, I hastily packed a bag, left a note behind, and embarked on a journey westward. Thankfully, I had a childhood friend, Lucas, residing about an hour past Baltimore, who graciously offered to host me for the weekend. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing I wouldn't risk encountering Sandra while at home. In my current state, I couldn't fathom feigning normalcy. It was all I could do to keep my emotions in check, to gather my thoughts, and devise a plan. Ironically, leaving that note was the first instance I ever lied to my wife, and it weighed heavily on my conscience. 
but in that moment, escape was imperative, and I wasn't ready to reveal my hand just yet. As I drove westward, I found myself grappling with profound questions about the woman I thought I knew so well. Had she mastered the art of compartmentalization to the extent that she could justify having two husbands? One thing became abundantly clear. My wife had mistaken trust for naivety. I had never been naive, and deceiving a husband who placed unwavering trust in her was hardly a feat. The days of blind trust were over. My marriage lay in ruins, awaiting its inevitable funeral. Childhood friends possess an uncanny ability to see through facades. They know you inside out, your past, your present, and your innermost thoughts. There's no hiding from them. Within minutes of my arrival at Lucas's place, he read the turmoil etched on my face. Sharing the devastating news, his reaction mirrored my own seething anger. But it was his wife, Tiffany, who urged us to temper our rage and approach the situation with clarity. She didn't defend Sandra. Rather, she implored me to reflect on my desires and avoid acting impulsively. A true understanding of the social dynamics at play often requires a woman's perspective. While my fury was directed at my wife and her alleged work husband, Tiffany's focus expanded to include the broader context of the workplace. In her eyes, it was the women who held the power over sexual dynamics, either actively participating or turning a blind eye. She quipped, men are pigs, and it's up to women to civilize them, sharing a knowing smile with her husband, who reluctantly concurred. I want to bring them all down. I'm divorcing my wife, that deceitful, unfaithful woman. She's betrayed me, and it's clear this isn't her first offense. I want to inflict pain on every single one of them. I want to make Mr. Martin Harris regret ever being born with a shred of decency, and I want every adulterer in that office to rue the day they chose to betray their vows. Tiffany attempted to inject some rationality into my seething anger. Be absolutely certain you're prepared for the consequences. There might be factors at play that you're unaware of. Perhaps she'll be consumed by remorse and never repeat her actions. You love this woman enough to marry her. Do you truly want to throw it all away now? Think it through. Reluctantly, I produced the damning evidence and together we watched the footage. Martin Harris, a mere pencil pusher, his domain was the realm of finances. While I dedicated myself to evening runs, he indulged in extravagant dining experiences. Martin Harris was anything but formidable. For 40 agonizing minutes, we bore witness to my wife surrendering herself to her supposed work husband. It was a soul-crushing experience. She wore a smile, even shared laughter, while I felt as though my world was crumbling around me. As the video concluded, a heavy silence settled over the room. I turned to Tiffany, seeking guidance. How long should I ponder this? I asked, desperate for clarity. She simply shook her head, enveloped me in a comforting embrace, and silently began preparing dinner. Lucas had pursued a career in law, an irony not lost on me. Yet he remained a loyal friend, and for that, I forgave him. His wife, a high school science teacher, possessed a surprisingly analytical mind. Over the course of the weekend, we engaged in countless discussions, and with their invaluable assistance, I began formulating a plan. Calling Tristan, I outlined my intentions. It would come at a cost, but with patience, it was feasible. We devised a strategy to divide my wife's office into two groups, management and those closely affiliated with Sandra, approximately 10 individuals, along with their respective work spouses. My goal wasn't merely to scorch them, I wanted to obliterate them. The remaining employees would feel the repercussions, albeit without draining my savings. Tristan would discreetly install cameras in the offices of management and the targeted coworkers, while the others would be captured on film entering and exiting through the lobby. When the time came to file for divorce, I would take legal action against the company, exposing the indiscretions of every employee's spouse. Throughout that weekend, I agonized over whether I had missed the warning signs. There must have been signs, I reasoned. She never appeared cold or indifferent. She was always supportive when I shared details about my work. Could she truly lead a double life without remorse? Was she perhaps a sociopath? Her jittery reaction when I confronted her about the wife remark on that fateful Friday suggested she was well aware of right and wrong, or at the very least, cognizant of potential consequences. 
I struggle to comprehend how anyone could sustain such duplicity without succumbing to a nervous breakdown. Somewhere amidst my contemplation, a troubling thought surfaced. By leaving town, I had unwittingly provided Sandra and her alleged paramour the ideal opportunity to use our home for their illicit rendezvous. Anger surged within me before I swiftly realized the futility of dwelling on it. In the grand scheme of things, their actions were inconsequential. I had already made up my mind to divorce her, irrespective of her current behavior. I resolved to leave her the bed, out of sheer practicality, and claim what was rightfully mine from the rest of the house. Steelier than ever, I braced myself for the forthcoming deception as I embarked on the drive home Sunday night. To save on expenses, we opted not to capture footage of the work spouses in their hotel rooms more than once, except for my wife and Mr. Harris. This minimized the number of room rentals and reduced the time required for Tristan's team. When it came to Sandra, I wanted to eliminate any possibility of her dismissing her actions as a one-time occurrence. In just two weeks, we achieved our objectives. Those weeks were excruciating. I loathed every moment. Some may question whether one instance was sufficient for retribution. While it certainly would have been, my desire for revenge extended beyond Sandra and Mr. Harris. I sought to expose the complicity of the entire office, the individuals who knew of my wife's infidelity yet remained silent. Uncovering their deceit required additional time. Most work spouses rend as vows once a week, with some being more frequent visitors to the hotel across the street and others less so. While we didn't catch them all, we captured enough to serve our purpose. Sandra and her accomplice adhered to a strict, every Wednesday schedule. To distance myself from the pain, I pretended to work late on numerous evenings. However, the ache of being home was unbearable. I concocted fictitious emergencies, supposedly requiring me to travel to Wallops on Thursdays, yet in reality, I spent those nights in a hotel near my workplace. On Friday nights, I sought solace in visiting Lucas and Tiffany once more, and on Monday nights, I returned to the hotel, seeking refuge from the torment of home. Sandra began to voice complaints about feeling neglected, and our relationship gradually turned icy. Little did she know the depth of that chill. Despite her efforts to maintain a facade of normalcy at home, I was emotionally distant, and it reflected in her demeanor. Seeking refuge, I relocated to the guest room for sleeping and made a point to leave the house early each morning. After all, I had my own set of deadlines at work. Perhaps Sandra sensed the strain in our marriage, or perhaps she bought into my flimsy excuses, or maybe she simply didn't care. Regardless, it didn't deter her from continuing her Wednesday lunches with her work husband. If anything, their lunch breaks only seemed to lengthen. It became evident that infidelity ran rampant in her workplace, with a significant portion of the staff, including many in senior positions, engaging in extramarital affairs. It was a case of the rot starting from the top, as the saying goes. Months later, upon reflection, I realized a glaring absence in the three videos I had viewed, not once did they mention me. Neither he nor she spoke ill of me or felt the need to defend my honor. What stung even more was the sight of her wearing her wedding rings throughout those encounters, a silent testament to her indifference towards our marriage. It was as though I were invisible, non-existent in that aspect of her life. While there was a semblance of tenderness between the two lovers, it felt hollow, lacking the genuine intimacy one would expect from a committed relationship. They were more than mere casual partners, yet fell short of being true lovers. The moment I witnessed my wife and her work husband saunter through the lobby, his arm possessively around her waist, heading towards their rendezvous, I knew the marriage was beyond salvaging. Watching them engage in their tryst confirmed there would be no room for discussions, excuses, or worn-out cliches. I was resolved to obliterate not just our marriage but also her entire workplace. I had no interest in hearing her apologies or witnessing her tears, and the mere notion of it being solely about sex was abhorrent. Three, no, four encounters would shatter any delusions of her fidelity. My lawyer meticulously drafted the legal documents, while Tristan handled the rest. At precisely 10 o'clock on Monday morning, a process server strode into the offices of Wilson & Wilson, serving both Sandra and Martin Harris at their desks. With a deliberate stride, he proceeded to the CEO's office, where he served the company itself. 
It's almost ironic in hindsight. The CEO, Simon Mosen, was complicit in the very infidelity I sought to expose. At 67, he had a trophy wife scarcely half his age. What drove him to seek solace in the arms of a 45-year-old secretary remains a perplexing enigma to me. My phone incessantly buzzed at 10.20, but I silenced it without a second thought. Meanwhile, five of Tristan's operatives commenced distributing Manila envelopes to the genuine spouses of every employee at the company. Some received photographs, others videos, accompanied by detailed reports they could utilize in divorce proceedings. Martin Harris' wife was given a particularly substantial envelope. For others, a letter served as a wake-up call, enlightening them about the unsavory activities unfolding at Wilson & Wilson, should they wish to confront their spouses upon returning home. Each envelope bore a brief note. In the spirit of transparency, you can thank Sandra Anderson for bringing this to our attention. I couldn't help but wonder how many allies my deceitful wife would have come Tuesday morning. Wilson and Wilson's demise was swift and profound. Following my lawsuit against the company, a deluge of 20 additional legal actions ensued. Divorces proliferated throughout the office like a raging inferno, consuming even marriages where evidence of infidelity was absent. Management's attempts to terminate employees tainted by the scandal only unveiled their own complicity in the debacle. Innocent individuals departed rapidly, seeking to salvage their tarnished reputations. The media seized upon the spectacle, and within two weeks, an article chronicling the firm's downfall prominently featured the term work spouses. I couldn't help but speculate about the source of that phrase. Perhaps it was coined by some clueless husband, ignorant of the realities of corporate culture. Business dwindled in the wake of the scandal, culminating in the closure of the office within two months. For nearly a year, the once bustling building stood eerily vacant. Eventually, I found myself seated across from Sandra in my lawyer's office. Tears streamed down her face as she attempted to convey remorse. After weeks of receiving a barrage of angry messages, punctuated by denials, pleas, and futile attempts at bribery and negotiation, she finally assumed a modicum of accountability for her actions. She attributed her transgressions to the allure and atmosphere of high finance. I struggled to comprehend the correlation between her infidelity and the financial sector, but evidently, it was ingrained in the culture. However, her apology was short-lived. In a baffling turn of events, she attempted to shift blame onto me, asserting that my failure to communicate my concerns contributed to the situation. Ridiculous. You shouldn't need to remind your spouse to abstain from engaging in extramarital affairs, let alone cultivating a so-called work husband in the first place. Sandra's infidelity remained a perplexing enigma to me, as she never provided a satisfactory explanation. All I could discern was that she had undergone a profound transformation. The once bright-eyed and seemingly honest woman with a passion for business had morphed into a deceitful and duplicitous individual, seemingly guided by the mantra, what he doesn't know won't hurt me. Tristan informed me that their liaisons only occurred on Wednesdays during their lunch breaks, and they hadn't seized the opportunity to meet during my absence from home that weekend. It was as if Sandra adhered to some twisted form of dual marriage, where cheating was constrained but not entirely eradicated. Tristan attempted to rationalize her behavior, suggesting it might be a perverse form of bonding ritual. Wilson & Wilson fostered a toxic corporate culture where team building was synonymous with intimate connections among co-workers. There seemed to be a distorted sense of loyalty at play where employees confined their extramarital activities to a single individual, often their closest colleague. Tristan speculated that they perceived themselves as intellectually superior, sharing a clandestine knowledge or engaging in collective risk-taking. Whether it was a shared secret or a warped social contract, I struggled to comprehend. Despite my efforts to make sense of the situation, I couldn't shake my emotional investment in both my marriage to Sandra and the circumstances surrounding our divorce. I faced a choice, to spend a lifetime grappling with the complexities of these individuals or to simply walk away. Ultimately, I opted for the latter. My quest for revenge didn't unfold as I envisioned. While I emerged victorious in my legal battles, the company coffers were barren, and Martin Harris faced near-total devastation in his divorce proceedings.
The irony wasn't lost on me. My own actions had precipitated the financial downfall of both the company and Harris, rendering them incapable of satisfying the legal judgments against them. My wife, stripped of her job, sought alimony upon our divorce, but my lawyer successfully argued that her unemployment was a direct consequence of her infidelity, and she was denied any financial support. Even the betrayed spouses, though wounded by their partner's betrayal, harbored resentment towards me for exposing the unpleasant truth, placing me squarely in their line of blame. It was an unforeseen consequence in a vast city where I could exist without their affection. However, one individual's reaction caught me off guard. Emma Harris approached me one evening at a bar, radiating an undeniable allure that captivated my attention. She introduced herself and took a seat beside me, her intentions palpable. I'm divorcing my husband, but I want more than just revenge, she declared. I want to confess to him that I slept with his mistress's husband. Will you assist me in this endeavor, Mr. Anderson? What do you say, Lester? Will you defile me and aid in humiliating the man who betrayed your wife? After some contemplation, I acquiesced. As it turned out, it was a decision I didn't regret. Sandra's family initially directed their anger towards me, but I decided to confront the issue head-on by showing them the incriminating video. Witnessing her betrayal firsthand, they were overcome with emotion, offering apologies and shedding tears. Ultimately, they absolved me of blame for the divorce, although they attempted to persuade me to grant Sandra a second chance. However, forgiveness eluded me. I couldn't recall Sandra ever asking for it, and my heart remained hardened for over a year. Reflecting on the events during my divorce, I couldn't help but feel a sense of irony. Despite my expertise in high-tech electronics, it was rudimentary methods, a parked car, a bribe to the desk clerk, and off-the-shelf miniature cameras that exposed Sandra's infidelity. It was a stark reminder that even the most advanced technology couldn't prevent betrayal in matters of the heart. Reflecting on how effortlessly I stumbled upon their deceit, I couldn't shake the thought of how easily they could have concealed their affair. It dawned on me after overhearing a couple of conversations. From that point on, their indiscretions were glaringly obvious. Couples nonchalantly crossing the street displayed a brazenness that bordered on arrogance. It begged the question, did anyone care about appearances anymore? It seemed almost inconceivable that they had managed to evade detection for so long. It made me question whether the world I inhabited bore any resemblance to the reality around me. Were such affairs commonplace? In the realm where I worked, those who boasted of their romantic conquests were usually solitary figures, their only companion being their own hand. Once again, I found myself relegated to the sidelines, observing the antics of the cool kids from afar. Occasionally, I catch glimpses of Sandra in passing, whether on the streets or in stores. We never exchange words, and I remain oblivious to her current endeavors. When our eyes meet, I see a flicker of sorrow in hers, but I can't bear to hold her gaze for long. The mere sight of her still tugs at my heartstrings, a reminder of the life I once knew that now lies in ruins. I've turned a corner, embarking on a journey of starting anew. Like a detonator igniting an explosion, I set events in motion that tore apart not only our relationship, but also my own sense of self. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.